We're here in Via Reggio in Italy at Azimut HQ this morning because Azimut is about to launch a new boat called the Magellano 60, and this is it. It joins an existing product line that already features the 66, the 25 meter and the 30 meter, and it very much follows that kind of aesthetic. Now, while Azimut has become famous in the past for very striking, modern, avant-garde kind of designs, this is absolutely not that. As you can see, it feels quite classical from the whole color to these kind of teak stripes that have become a trademark of the Magellano line. And as you walk through the boat, you'll see plenty of other ways in which it kind of revoices a sense of heritage rather than committing wholly to modernity. And it's, it's uh, quite an attractive thing, certainly quite a distinctive thing. Let's step on board at this starboard passerelle and head into the cockpit. Straight away you can see we've got a glass parapet there. And what you can probably also see is the fact that uh, this boat, like many others these days, instead of having a transverse uh, bench seat at the aft end that kind of cuts off your view, we've got fore and aft furniture. So you can keep that view wide open. We also have very narrow stanchions here, black stanchions as well. Uh, if I pop around the corner, you'll see just on the port side deck, we also have kind of black guardrails here as well. That's, uh, that's new to Azimut. It looks very cool. And it keeps this aft cockpit feeling wide open. Now you can, of course, open out this table quite easily seat six people for lunch. That's a high-low table, an option, so that does drop down lower, but if you want to use infills, then that's very much a custom option to turn that into a sunbed. That's not part of a standard package. As I say, this is boat number one, though, so it's not quite the fully resolved article. There are still some issues that they're uh, kind of working through and ironing out just to deliver the kind of package that their customers actually want. Now, if we move to the port side, you'll see we've got a side gate there. We've also got another one there on the starboard side. They're both standard. And if I look here, being beautifully modelled by the Azimut lady, there's a couple of stalls at this aft galley. And it's a single level deck here, so it really kind of invites that inside space out into this aft cockpit. And of course, these stalls, they spin so you can face aft, join the other guys at this uh, cockpit party. But there are options here, of course. You can get rid of this uh, inside-outside bar and you can have a storage unit there instead. But that would seem like a bit of a waste of that space. This is a very attractive kind of feature. Now let's make our way forward and see what we see up on the foredeck. And as we do so, we take a little step up. And you'll see as we walk around this boat, there are quite a lot of little steps, quite a, a variety of deck levels, particularly um, downstairs on the lower deck and upstairs on the flybridge. Under here we've got the diesel filler. We've got a pair of 1800 litre fuel tanks here. So three and a half thousand, three thousand six hundred litres in total. And as you make our way forward, you'll see this huge plunging glass panel on the side of that saloon for fantastic views. And as that dips, so of course does the bulwark to give you maximum impact from that. Again, as we move towards the bow, another couple of steps to make our way up there. And when we get here, that's a pretty good size. If you compare it to the existing Azimut 60 Fly, it feels significantly bigger, I have to say. Now you can shade this entire space uh, from the sun, but rather than uh, sunshade coming out from the leading edge here above the uh, main deck screen, we've got a slightly elevated receptacle for a rod so that uh, you can really preserve head height as you walk beneath it. Don't have to stoop down to get in there. If I walk forward, you'll see that the leading edge of that sunshade is right at the front of that sun pad. So the entire space can be shaded if you like. There's also a little 
fold up mechanism here. This is not actually working today. We're struggling to erect that, but basically that swings up into place and you can open out that table and have a big party for the full ships company of 12 there up on the bow. So that's quite attractive. Let's make our way down the port side now. This incidentally is, well, kind of on most boats is a seamanship locker, but as you'll see, it goes all the way through. So you can store those big rods for the sunshade in there without a problem, it goes underneath that seating. We also have a set of these. We see these all over the place now. Automatic lights, uh, little LED cylinders that pop up in frosted glass so they can give you an ambient glow at night without blinding you. And I have to say, it feels quite safe up here. We've got good sturdy mouldings here. It's much more than a tow rail and really heavy duty uh, guardrails on top of that. And step back down and head aft again. Because what you've probably noticed as I've been going around here is the fact that these bulwarks are actually quite narrow, far more narrow than you would tend to anticipate. And actually, if I look down there, you'll see that the walkway is also relatively narrow. And the idea behind that is to maximize the beam in this internal saloon. Now, the entire beam of this boat is only 16 foot 11. That's not huge by 60 foot uh, flybridge cruiser standards. But because they've used those narrow side decks, because they've used the narrow bulwarks, what we have in here is 10% more volume than you'll tend to expect on the existing 60 fly. Now that's used here for that aft galley, as I mentioned. What we have is an induction hob. There's no option for anything else. That reduces complication, increases safety. They're not so keen on having uh, gas on board and that makes a decent bit of sense. We also have plenty of style. If you look at this yes. overhead storage, this is an Italian boat, of course. So style does take centre stage. We also have all the other things you'd expect of a high-end galley. A good dishwasher in there and a uh, oven down below. And on the starboard side, a nice big fridge freezer there, which kind of splits the galley functions in two keeps it nice and open, keeps the views relatively open and also the companion way through the centre. There's another step up towards that lounge. And as we take that step, it's interesting to see this TV. This is quite a cool device because obviously it pops out of there at the press of a button and then at the push of another button, it rotates so it can face across to that port lounge area, face forward to the guys at that starboard dinette. It can angle across to the people in the galley or it can face aft towards the people at the bar or the people further aft in the cockpit. As you move up onto this lounge level, it's worth noticing more little design motifs that enable this boat just to feel a little bit more classical than its uh, sister lines in the Azimut fleet. And when you get up here, you realise what an impressive space this is. This furniture treads the ideal line between uh, style and storage. I mean, they don't want to make it too low because if they do so, there's no volume inside to store your gear. And we do have plenty of storage inside if I hinge that up. Usefully compartmentalized as well. There's storage beneath all of these seats. But of course, they've kept it as low as they can to maximize this sense of space and volume to enable the light to flood in and to keep the views wide open and they're really impressive all round, but they're particularly impressive, of course, on the starboard side where this window drops right down to deck level. That's fantastic. And I also like the orientation of this dinette on the starboard side. And conventionally in most saloons, you'll tend to see peripheral furniture that faces inward. But this feels just that bit more intimate. It's a lovely little space for a lunch with a big view. And because it has these little wings outboard, it means you can still use them as chaise longs, arrange yourself and face across to the other guys on this lounge on the port side. There's also, if you don't fancy heading back to the galley for cold drinks, the option of a little fridge here at the top of these steps. As things stand, that's storage, but as I say, you can have a fridge inset into that bulkhead there. So you can serve the people just here at that lounge or at the starboard helm. But let's make our way up onto the flybridge and see what we find up there. 
Now we access that via the starboard side. Again, natural teak everywhere you look. And as we get up here, you'll see the steps that I'm talking about. Another little step there that separates the aft section from the forward section, a little raise in the deck level. But immediately when you get up here, you're struck by the kind of similarities in layout. Again, we've got a big C-shaped seating area on the port side opposite a starboard two-man helm. Here though, it's more sociable because we've also got a forward sunbathing area to keep the guys here company underway. Of course, this backrest can be popped forward to create an unbroken C-shaped seating area, but here they've just eased it back. And the idea is that a couple of people can sit there, low level facing forward, and get proper protection from that wind deflector. Here on the starboard side, you kind of anticipate this will lift up and reveal a wet bar. It doesn't, that's a, a fixed unit. What we get under there instead is simply storage. But there will be an option, I think, to include a TV in there so that lifts out. So you can sit there at that C-shaped dining area and watch the TV across from you. And as we head aft, you'll see really the linchpin of this Flybridge's arrangement, and that's this central section, this huge central stanchion. There is also one of these central masts to hold up the hardtop on the 66, but there they need four of these additional bars to provide support. Well, here they've strengthened up this central mast. They've enlarged it and reinforced it, and that means we only need two of those bars. If you look at the aft end of that hardtop, there's absolutely no need for any additional support at all. And that keeps the views up here wide open. It's a really clever design idea, that. And here's the Flybridge wet bar we've been looking for. An absolutely massive sink on the port side, an electric griddle in the middle, plus a nice little chopping surface there. We've also got a good size of fridge down below. Lots of storage space in here, but of course you can also have an ice maker there if you want it. And what's particularly interesting here is the fact that there's a tap mounted on the side of this central mast. And the reason for that, if I look up, is this. We've got a shower up here, and on the face of it, that seems really very odd indeed. But Azimut tells me that this is the result of feedback from their customers. Because you're up on the flybridge and you're relatively divorced from the sea down below, what they want is the chance just to freshen off with a little shower while they're up here enjoying the sun. And this is the means by which they achieve it. Now, of course, in order to accommodate that, make it practical, all this furniture is waterproof, wiped down, wiped clean, very easy to maintain. And as on the main deck, this aft end is pretty wide open. There are options here. You can have the same kind of fore and aft furniture with a gap in the center, which keeps the aft views really, really big. But this is the option with additional cup holders and that central infill, a C-shaped unit, much like the one further forward. So you can obviously pop a freestanding table in here and use this as an aft dining station. Now, before we take this boat out on the water and see how she does, let's pop down below and take a look at the accommodation. A relatively quick look because, of course, this boat, being a 60-footer, pretty much shares the same layout as the existing 60-fly. There's a port stairwell that twists around into the centre. There's a good mirror down there as you get down to the bottom to bounce the light around a little. And as we've seen elsewhere, additional steps kind of divide up the levels a little. Let's start aft though, in the owner's cabin, full beam. And what we have here is a chaise long on the starboard side, plus hanging storage and an inbuilt TV which actually operates like a mirror, as you can see, until you actually turn it on. More hanging storage on the port side and a storage unit, again, with this kind of uh, classical wicker design. And while we're in here, it's worth noticing also the fact that Azimut really hasn't gone for anything too stark or design-driven. What it's gone for here is a homely vibe. So if we look at these bulkheads, there's a softness to it. Look down at this carpet. It's quite deep and homely, quite warm, quite friendly. It's designed to be a very easy place to spend a lot of time because, of course, the Magellano line is all about long-distance cruising with your family. 
Now, having said that this boat pretty much mirrors the lower deck layout of the Fly 60, there are ways in which it differs, and one of those is this central bed. On the Fly 60, it runs transverse from the starboard side. Well, here, it runs fore and aft in the center. But it does provide the same degree of storage as you'll see if I just reach my hand under here, stick it in this hole and let the rams do the work, up that comes. That is a tremendous amount of storage in there, really easy access. And they're such strong rams actually, it's more difficult to put the hatch down than it is to lift it up. There we are. Another way in which this boat differs as well is, is volume. You feel that most keenly, I think, in the bathrooms and head compartments. Again, there's lots of style here, lots of light, curved edges, very pleasant materials, nothing too showy or ostentatious. It just feels good, it feels homely, it feels warm, it works. A nice big separate shower cubicle. You do lose a bit of headroom there, but that's no problem because you've got a low level seat. And that's probably big enough actually for two people in the morning. It's a very stylish space. Let's close that up and move forward again, because this is where it gets really interesting in terms of the design decisions that uh, Azimut has made. Now we have a heads compartment here. That's your day heads on the starboard side. And that sits just behind the starboard twin cabin. And there it is. That's a permanent twin cabin. You can't convert that to a double. So the guys who stay in here will use that day heads for their own purposes. But interestingly, if I spin around and take a look at the VIP cabin, you'll see that this is an ensuite room. Again, very similar to the Fly 60, and you access those ensuite facilities on the port side. So far, so good. But if we pop back out into this central corridor, you'll see that there's additional access from here. On the face of it, that doesn't appear to make a lot of sense because we already have a day heads further aft. The idea apparently is that they haven't quite decided how to use this third bathroom. There's uh, potential, depending on client input, for this to be turned into a pantry or else a dressing room. And that's why they retained this door. But actually, this boat is rated to 12 and there are plenty of enjoyable day spaces up top. So if you use it that way, it might make sense to retain this, whatever happens, because having two bathrooms accessible as day heads for the guests up top just takes the pressure off if you're enjoying a large party. Now actually, as we make our way back up the stairs, before we get out on the water, there are two other spaces we haven't yet taken a look at. Let's head aft and take a look at them right now. Thank you. The first of those is the crew cabin back onto the passerelle, down onto this high-low platform, which incidentally is capable of carrying a 3.3 meter tender. We have a bit of storage behind there for shore power cables and lines and fenders. And here, on the port side is access to your crew cabin. Now there are no options here, this is what you get. It's a relatively tight access point and it goes straight down into your heads and shower room. There's a sink there, a toilet, and a curtain to cordon off your shower. If I look across, you can see that this is actually being used by one of the crew already. Now, there are no windows out onto that uh, our swim platform, of course, because we've got the storage unit you just walk past, running transverse across that section. But there's decent storage in there. And it kind of makes sense that it would come like this regardless, because whether you have a mattress in here or not, whether you have a shower in here or not, it's equally useful as a storage facility if you don't tend to take crew. Now, as I make my way back out of here, you'll notice that there's no access from that crew cabin to the engine room. So we'll pop back up onto this passerelle into the cockpit and take a look via this hatch here. Now, apologies for the noise. As I say, we're about to set off. If I spin myself around, what you'll see here is a pair of MAN i6 730 horsepower diesels. Now, they're 13.7 litre units. So that's a really big capacity to generate 730 horsepower. 
and actually 730 horsepower, twin 730s, is not an awful lot of power for a boat of this scale, but they're going for reliability and efficiency. They don't want to stress these engines overly. So they want big capacity, big block engines, and they believe they can still get the best part of 26, 27 knots out of them. Now they're operating through V drives, as you can see, you see the shaft pointing back aft there, angling down to exit the hole. And that of course saves lots of space, and it needs to, because it's not a huge engine room. We've got the switch panel there, and if I spin around, you'll see we've got room behind the ladder for a sea keeper down there, and a generator up there. And besides that, there's not a lot of room for anything else. So it's quite an impressive job to squeeze a couple of such sizable engines into an engine space of these proportions. And as I say, we have a pair of MAN 730 diesels back there on V-drives. So you don't expect a tremendous amount in the way of performance. But she scoots up onto the uh, plane okay. I say onto the plane, it's a semi-planing hull this. They call it a dual mode hull with uh, a steep vertical bow and double chimes. The idea, they tell us, is that it saves about 20% on comparable shaft driven boats. Now we've had them up and running a fair bit here this morning and the economy does actually look pretty good. If I come down to around about seven knots, that's of course relatively uh, slow, that's a very sedate sort of cruising speed but if you own the boat and you want to save fuel a lot of people will do it that way. Around about seven knots we're seeing just 20, 21 litres per hour, so about three litres per nautical mile. Now we've got those 3,600 litre tanks or twin 1,800 litre tanks. So if we uh, leave a bit in reserve, 3,000 litres at uh, three litres per nautical mile, you've got a good thousand mile range there, which is fantastic. If we up that pace to 10 knots, the fuel flow increases to around about 60 litres per hour. So six litres per nautical mile for a 500 mile range. And that's all pretty good, if unspectacular. It's higher up the rev range this boat really comes into its own, I think, between 14 and 24 knots. And this tops out at 26.5 knots. So 24 knots is a pretty rapid cruise. We're still only seeing about 10 litres per nautical mile disappearing from our fuel tanks. So we still have a good usable 300 nautical mile range. Now let's just check to the side of us, get her up to pace a little bit more and we'll swing her into a turn. We'll go to port first, put her hard over. It's a decent bit of hill. We wash off a little bit of pace there, maybe half a knot, but it's not bad at all. And visibility is absolutely massive all around here. As I say, there are no stanchions here aside from these narrow gauge things at the front end of that hard top so it's really effective. Also they use a bit of carbon fibre up here so it doesn't feel like a particularly weighty boat up top. I bring her back onto the straight and we level up nicely. Now let's swing around to starboard this time. As we do so I've got to say and you hear this from all the manufacturers oh, our wind deflector will keep you safe it will keep you out of the wind blast out of the cold breeze. This one actually kind of works. Yeah, my hair's a little bit ruffled, but it's much better than most. And actually on that port uh, seat, that kind of lounge seat, that twin seat that faces forward just to that side of us, their promises ring true. You lie yourself down there, prop yourself up. It's a really relaxed place to be and you're well out of the breeze. It's worth noting while we've been putting together these performance figures and quite impressive performance figures they are too. We've got six people on board, it's rated to carry 12 of course, but we've also got 100% uh, water and our fuel tank is 70% full too. So we're carrying a decent load here today and still achieving quite easily in excess of 26 knots, just touching on 27. As I say, we've also got a uh, joystick here just ahead of the throttles. And actually the throttles are quite a nice little uh, rest. 
for your forearm so you can just really accurately do your thing, come alongside. The views down the sides of the boat are also pretty good, but it's worth noting actually that uh, this is a starboard helm. The one on the main deck, that's a starboard helm, and your option for a third helm aft, well, because of those stylish kind of narrow gauge moldings they have at the back end there to keep things wide open to create extra internal volume, well, there's no space for a third helm on the port side, so that too sits on the starboard side. Uh, which is not ideal, of course, because occasionally you might have to come alongside to port. Now, down at this uh, lower helm, again, twin seats as I say, traditional wheel, same instruments plus an additional uh, engine display and some lovely air conditioning. That's extremely welcome. Now these seats here, we have little buttons so you can lift the seat up, simple as that. You can move it forwards and backwards but there's not a lot of travel backwards. So actually, when you perch yourself in here at the wheel, if you like to stand as I do, you're pretty tight up against the wheel. You wouldn't want to be a particularly big fella. You might struggle to squeeze in here, I think. Now, when you come down to the main deck helm from the flybridge, one of the key things you really want to see is decent visibility. And it is a little bit hemmed in. And the roof line is relatively low. We've got a stanchion in the middle of that screen. It's not a one piece screen. And because the deck level drops away off towards the galley, you do lose a little visibility aft too, particularly when you're in the turn, of course. But at the lower end of the speed range, when you're just pushing on through sort of five, 10, 15 knots, it can help a little just to drop a couple of tabs, just to pin the nose down a little lower for improved visibility aft. By the way, it's relatively refined in here. We've got the aft doors closed now. We've got the air conditioning running. That's making a bit of a hiss, but we're still only seeing at about uh, 73 to 74 decibels at a cruise of around 20 knots, which is very serviceable indeed, long distance. This then is a really enjoyable boat to be on board. And yeah, there are elements of it where changing deck levels kind of create trip hazards if you're, uh, if you're not careful, if you're not aware of them. And also the main deck helm is a bit tight, but just take a look on that flybridge. It's a really cool space, particularly because of that clever central mast that keeps everything wide open. And down here on the main deck, we've got wide open cockpits again, both fore and aft, really easy places to enjoy. And then of course, there's the saloon. In spite of a relatively modest beam of just uh, 16 foot 11, they've used some clever design touches to generate extra volume in there, and that volume is well used. And then down below, I know it's kind of a reinterpretation of the established Fly 60 layout, but it adds extra volume, particularly in those bathrooms, and it gives you a lovely homely vibe that doesn't feel at all starchy or over-designed. So if you want all of those positive features in a single boat that delivers it all in a cool, classical, aesthetic, this is a very easy boat to like.